Hello and welcome to this real world industry analysis video from Astranti Financial Training. My name is Richard Lewis, I'm a writer and a tutor here at Astranti. I began my career about 20 years ago as a business journalist, um, doing financial reporting mainly, and then became an industry analyst, briefing CEOs and chairmen on industry trends. Uh, in consumer behaviour, in supply chain, marketing, IT and finance. And now I'm going to take you through this pack. In this video, I'm going to be giving you the real world industry context for the case study exam. So I'm not going to be going through the pre c materials in this video. The point of this uh, particular pack is uh, to give you uh, the context of the real world industry in which Mentine, your case study company, uh, is in theory operating. So um, the film industry is a real industry, uh, Mentine is a made up company, but it's operating within a set of industry uh, characteristics that actually exist in the real world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, open up the industry pack here uh, and take you uh, through to um, uh, this section here. Uh, as part of the history of the film industry, what we saw around about the mid-1920s was the uh, growth of what's become known as the studio system. Okay, so this is the idea that you've got um, uh, a few very large and powerful vertically integrated um, film production and distribution companies. Okay, so the idea was um, that you had people producing films uh, and then you had um, people who would then get those films into uh, theatres, cinemas as we call them. In the film industry they tend to talk about theatres and they mean cinemas. Um, and other bits of the uh, uh, value chain were all consolidated into this vertically integrated company and it meant really that these film studios owned their own distribution divisions and they had pretty much locked down the supply chain from production through to uh, the box office. Okay, so this consolidation of the film production industry around the Hollywood area in the US happened quite early on um, in the history of film. Um, only the, the industry was only about 20, 30 years old, really, by the time this started to happen. Um, and it meant it was quite hard for other companies to get in. They created significant barriers to entry uh, by owning the means of production and the means of distribution it meant it's very hard for smaller companies uh, to get a look in all right so we've got Mentine which is a European um, film studio okay and Mentine is definitely one of these type of companies it's an integrated vertically integrated film production and distribution company. So it is actually one of the industry gatekeepers. It's got significant power and it can be thought of as a, as a major studio. And that means that as a European studio, Mentine is competing with the big giants, Walt Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony. Um, if you look at the film industry as a giant ecosystem, Mentine is one of the big fish. And as one of the big fish, we can say that Mentine is actually part of the mainstream studio system in Europe and, of course, globally. OK, so the existence of what we call the studio system um, creates uh, a stronghold uh, in the Hollywood uh, industry. Hollywood, this is about the US companies that are all based around uh, Los Angeles. Um, even though these companies only produced 622 feature films in 2013, compared to the vast array of European productions that came out in the same time, 
those 622 firms accounted for 70% um, of the European uh, Union, of the EU market, okay, and um, European companies only got 26% of the market together. So you can see that Hollywood is a very big force. It's the major, um, it accounts for the major part of the market share. Okay, so a company like Mentine, which is operating in Europe, is competing against uh, real power in the market. So in the pack, I reiterate here this point about the fact that these companies are vertically integrated uh, and how they've got production and distribution activities all tied up within the same company, uh, and that gives them a lot of their power. I also mention uh, here that uh, seven of the top ten global media groups uh, have a specific filmmaking uh, part to them. So what we're talking about if, uh, are filmmaking companies that are part of major global media conglomerates. So there's some serious money and some serious power behind these companies. So what does this mean for Mentine? If we look at the real world industry, we can see that there's really only one company uh, in the European Union that is uh, competing with the Hollywood majors on that sort of level, that Studio Canal, uh, which is a French company owned by Vivendi. Um, and so what you've got is this massive uh, barrier to entry created by Hollywood, very difficult uh, for EU companies uh, to get in. All right, so that's all I want to say about the general big picture, about the um, consolidation of power in Hollywood and the difficulty for European companies like Mentine to get a look into the industry. So the fact that Mentine is uh, a major force um, is significant because it means that it really can compete on the global scene. But it's always got to be mindful of the fact that it's in some ways... Uh, fighting against uh, a system that has much more power than it does. So it's done quite well, but it's always got to be looking over its shoulder to some degree. Now, for the first 80 years or so of its existence, the film industry uh, pretty much had uh, the idea completely sewn down. Uh, the idea was that you sold uh, tickets uh, to see uh, the, the latest film that your studio produced and consumers went to the theatre and watched it and um, that was the idea either they did go either they did go to the cinema or they didn't um, there wasn't really any other way to see a film if you wanted to see the latest um, movie you had to go out buy your ticket stand in line sit down buy your popcorn and and, and so forth now I'm sadly old enough to remember uh, the emergence in the 1980s of the video tape rentals market um, and this was the idea that suddenly you didn't have to go to the cinema in order to see a film you could just rent um, a VHS uh, video cassette or even Betamax right at the beginning uh, put it in your expensively purchased uh, video player and watch it uh, on your home television so the rise of video and home viewing whoops um home viewing was certainly quite a revolutionary idea hadn't uh, been possible before then but you know the cost of videotapes and so forth had come down so you could actually go out and rent um a, a video <clears throat> of the film that you wanted to see uh, invite your friends around to your house and have a kind of movie watching experience in your own home so that uh definitely damaged box office takings and created um, a threat to the film industry as we know and many of those old kind of movie theatres uh, that used to exist um, are closed down because of the rentals industry they just couldn't tempt people in to the cinema and even as late as about 1995 1996 I still had a blockbuster video card and I would go down the road and I'd rent some videotape from some surly clerk who didn't really uh, like his job and then you'd go and watch your disappointing film in your disappointing house and you'd be charged a massive fee um, for bringing it back late 
It was kind of terrible, but it was definitely cheaper than going to the cinema. But the cinema fought back. So that industry is more or less dead these days. What we saw was um, cinema becoming a lot more dynamic. We started that th those old movie theatres that were a bit funky and run down. They closed down and what we started seeing were the large multi-screen complexes. We started seeing very flashy kinds of cinemas that were quite exciting places to go to. There was much more choice uh, of films uh, because one of the things that video rentals uh, created was more choice. You could go uh, to a video rental shop and have a choice of you know, 100, 200 films that you could watch, uh, none of which were any good really, but um, you could have a massive choice and the cinema could only afford to buy in, you know, three or four prints. So it was quite um, a big step for cinema to create these multi-screen complexes and say, OK, like we've now got ten films um, for you to choose between. And that helped bring a lot of people back into the cinema and create more of an event, more of a night out sort of experience. And to some extent, uh, the sale of DVDs uh, came to the rescue of uh, the film studios um, by providing an additional sales outlet. So as people became a bit more affluent um, in the 90s and towards the 2000s, uh, people started having a bit more money in their pockets. And so it became feasible to actually go and purchase a DVD of a film that you liked um, perhaps one that you'd already seen in the cinema and then you'd go out and purchase it and you'd own it and then you'd watch it uh, once and then file it on your bookshelf and then probably never watch it again. But instead of paying £3 to rent it, you'd paid £10-£15 to own it uh, and that was actually quite good for the film studios. So that was kind of a mini threat that ar that arose in the 80s and 90s and subsided again um, with cinema and the film studios winning through. But in the last 10 years or so, we've started to see uh, another threat. OK, and that, particularly since the global financial crisis in 2008, caused recession and caused people to feel that they had a lot less money in their pockets, what we're seeing is that both sales channels, uh, both box office sales and DVD sales, are being harmed today by online streaming video services. Now, uh, I'm fairly sure you know what this means. It means Netflix, it means Hulu, it means Amazon Prime uh, and others, uh, which are offering a far wider range of uh, movie, uh, of feature film and TV series content uh, than the rental, the video rental shops ever could. And they do it for a very low monthly subscription. So you're not even paying per unit, you're not paying per view. You just pay five, six pounds a month or whatever it is. Um, and you get to watch as many movies and television series as you can, as you can eat. It's all you can eat. And this is really harming box office sales and it's harming DVD sales. And it means that the large, consolidated, vertically integrated studios are being challenged to find a way through and they're being challenged to diversify. OK. OK, so let's just imagine you're a large Hollywood studio and you're a bit worried uh, about Netflix and uh, its uh, rivals and you need to look into diversifying your revenue streams. What have you got? What are your assets? You've got an awful lot of intellectual property which can be exploited in many more ways than just a feature film. OK, so you've got a situation where you can make a video game from an intellectual property that you've got. And by an intellectual property, I'm talking about um, a character universe or a set of uh, character universes like Star Wars or Captain America or Paddington Bear, uh, which are owned uh, by rights holders uh, and exploited as 
intellectual property. You own these as the um, film studio, as the rights holder. You've acquired these rights from the writer or the creator, and you've now uh, got the right to exploit these. So you can do it in many more ways than just uh, a feature film. So video games, uh, television series, you can make spin-offs, you can make a theme park. You've got back lots uh, on, on your studio that have got all kinds of sets and dinosaurs and spaceships and things that you can take people around who are interested in it. Um, and, of course, yes, you can uh, actually start to put some of your backlist uh, content out on the home video on the streaming on demand uh, market now your back list uh, and your front list okay let's talk about those two terms your front list is the stuff you're promoting now it's the new film it's the latest uh, property that you're putting out into the world and you hope everyone's going to go into the cinema to the box office and give you lots of money uh, for tickets uh, your back list are uh, all the titles uh, that you have in your library that you put out two years ago, three years ago, ten years ago, fifty years ago, and all the titles that you acquired when you took over that smaller film studio a few years ago, you acquired all their titles too. They all form part of your backlist and they all form uh, part of a, a large web of, of properties, intellectual properties that you can keep on exploiting. Okay, so you can carry on making money from your backlist long after the front list buzz and hype has died down. Okay, so that's a good concept to have uh, under your belt. Okay, and of course book publishing as well. Uh, there's also merchandising, we'll come on to that a little bit later. So the current situation is challenging film studios to think much wider and in some ways they're becoming much more like uh, media corporations really than, than simply film studios okay so that's one way they can diversify another way they can diversify is to if you've got a production company and a distribution company all together in your company uh, structure you don't necessarily have to use your film production company only to work on the properties you've acquired. You can rent out uh, your services to rivals um, and uh, get money from their productions as well. So co-production is a big deal in the film industry. Okay, So a company like, I've, I've used the example here of uh, Bad Robot, um, which uh, handle uh, lots of things for, very, for a wide range of different companies okay so that means in terms of company structure if you uh, are a film studio and you've got your um, uh, rights acquisition activities you've got your film production activities and your film distribution activities all in one company well what's to say you can't spin off these asset heavy companies the ones that have to do all the film production uh, and let them serve a wide range of customers um, and keep the core part of your business um, as a kind of asset light financing and distribution entity okay so that's quite an interesting <clears throat> development and it's something we're seeing more and more of another way that you can um, diversify uh, is to expand the reach of a property that you've got. So this is quite a, a common thing. We're well, well aware of the idea of the uh, the sequel. Um, you have a piece of intellectual property that you've acquired. Let's say you've got Paddington Bear and you make a film. Hooray, it's all over, is it? The next thing? No, you can carry on exploiting that Paddington Bear property forever and turn it into a franchise, what's known as a franchise. So it's not just about one film, it's about the film and the sequel and the third sequel and all the merchandising and the games and the books that are going to come around that and make it into a cinematic universe or a franchise. Okay, so we're familiar with some of these movie franchises. We've got um, you know Marvel superhero related ones that are very big at the moment. Uh, things like Star Wars, for example, is another a very well known movie franchise. Um, you know, in 2016, The Force Awakens was the highest grossing 3D movie in North America. Okay, 
backlots we covered, um, which is the idea that you take people <clears throat> on studio tours. Okay, and never forget that when you've got a good franchise, all right, let's say Star Wars, um, you've when you put out the new film in the series, all the backlist gets a little boost as well, doesn't it? So you can repackage things, and so you've made the new Star Wars film, all of a sudden you can, instead of marketing six films before, and this is the new one, you can market a seven film box set. You've got a new addition to it, so you can repackage and resell and boost sales of your backlist products forever and ever and ever and ever, in theory, <laughs> until the, the horse is well and truly, truly flogged. Okay, so that's the idea of the film franchise. Okay, and it's becoming increasingly important because, as we've covered a little bit before, the tanks are well and truly on the lawn. Okay, never in the history of cinema has it been easier for consumers to ignore the cinema. Um, they really have it very good. Look at the size of this flat screen TV, it's enormous. And obviously this is an advert for Netflix, so they're obviously showing, trying to show it in as good a light as possible. But actually, this um, uh, little vignette here is not so uncommon. We might not be living in, uh, in a large uh, brick warehouse, but other than that, it's quite a common sight, isn't it? To sit down with your friends or your family in front of your large widescreen TV, um, which is not so expensive these days as it used to be. Um, and you've got your Netflix and you say, OK, what will we watch? We've got a choice of you know 300 um, films to watch. Fantastic. So in the pack, I go through uh, in a little bit more detail uh, about uh, the exact uh, factors that are playing into this. And I want to move on now to uh, something which is related, and that is the rise of television. I say here television used to be cinema's ugly cousin. Okay, Television used to be the cheapo uh, version of video content. It was done on a, uh, a shoestring budget and things weren't that great. Not anymore. The rise of the cable networks and increasingly the acquisition of uh, these networks by the big media conglomerates who also own the film studios means that uh, amazing production facilities are now available uh, on the, on the uh, television uh, scene. It means that we start to get productions uh, like Game of Thrones, uh, like Mad Men, Breaking Bad, which have very high production values uh, and are almost like mini films in themselves, hour-long episodes that last, you know, 23 episodes per season for seven seasons. This is big news. It's appointment viewing um, and increasingly the on-demand video streaming services like Netflix are acquiring these uh, properties uh, right at the start and actually broadcasting them, if you like, uh, on the streaming services before they ever get to the television networks. So we've got a situation here where you have an enormous threat of substitution. So what does this mean for uh, the life cycle of the industry? Are we really looking at a decline? Well, the answer is the numbers tell us that although we are looking at significant threats to the industry, it's still a bit early to characterise that as a decline. We're in the mature stage of the industry life cycle. The industry is technically growing, okay? So it's still doing more each year uh, than it did the year before. However, what you do have uh, is a situation where film production costs are rising and you've got a dwindling theatre attendance in the West. Now when I talk about the West globally, um, I'm talking about the UK, Europe uh, and North America. It's actually going through tough times now. Uh, while you have markets in the East like China and India, um, which are uh, coming on stream as more affluent consumer markets, and so here we're seeing cinema attendance growing well. Okay, so on the global scene, the cinema 
uh, market, the box office market, is still growing. But you've got to understand that dwindling theatre attendance in the Western economies is being offset to some degree by growing consumer economies in the East. Now, also in the West, uh, we, we are seeing revenue growing each year in the real world industry. But what you need to understand there as well is that ticket prices are going up. And that's masking the fact that actually the number, the volume of tickets being sold is actually falling. So the film industry is holding its revenue uh, curve slightly upwards, but it's doing so uh, to some degree. It's a bit like putting plaster, a plaster on a, on a wound that's bleeding. Um, you can carry on raising ticket prices uh, for so long to mask the fact that fewer people are going to the cinema but eventually that's going to break because that's not sustainable you can't pay a thousand pounds uh for a cinema ticket at some point the, the pain point is going to be reached and consumers are going to go no i'm not paying uh that much to go and see a film when i can you know just stay at home and watch netflix so it's it's very tricky all right a couple of points here on this page uh which are related um so uh, we're talking about um, high cost special effects. This is what's pushing up production uh, costs. And the reason that they're doing this is that the big budget action films are actually um, more attractive to consumers um, than the uh, romantic dramas or the wacky comedies. Those ones don't really bring in the high volume ticket sales. It's always those uh, giant action films with a lot of bangs and impacts and crashes and speed and blowing things up. That's what people go to see and that's what makes the money All right, in cinema. So before we move on, let's just draw a quick line under what we've been talking about here. The key point that I want to make in this section of the video is that this studio system uh, that's had a stranglehold over the industry uh, for uh, you know 100 years or so is under threat now as the market evolves. The market isn't uh, dying, but it is evolving. So companies operating in the film industry in this market are facing static or rising production costs, dwindling box office takings, and some investor hesitance because of the increased risk. Now that in itself increases risk in what was already a very risky business. So we've got here an industry that costs enormous amounts of money uh, to keep moving, which is becoming increasingly uh, a risky bet for investors because uh, people are not necessarily going to the cinema as much. Okay. While cinema is mature, it's not facing decline uniformly everywhere. And from the pre-scene, what I want to bring out is the fact that it's not declining in B-Land. B-Land uh, cinema attendance is rising. Uh, that's uh, bucking the trend, if you like. So that's something to pull out and make a note of. There are definite opportunities for box office growth uh, in the large developing markets, as we've mentioned in China and India. OK, so B-Land is a bit special. It bucks the general trend. So Mentine, what Mentine may want to do is rein in some of these operations uh, in those risky markets and focus on its uh, somewhat healthier domestic market and the developing economies. If I was Mentine and I had operations in uh, the UK and the US uh, where we're seeing dwindling uh, box office attendance, I might want to focus more on B-Land focused activities and move uh, some uh, investment to uh, China and India where we're going to see some uh, profit. OK, that's the main point from this section. Now, just before I go, let me remind you that this is not the end of it. We do offer a full range of support materials, including the study text and other course videos. Uh, we do the industry analysis, where we look at the real world industry that your case study is based on. We do mock exams around the case study exam, and we offer marking feedback and masterclasses, all of which are covered by the Astranti Pass Guarantee. So I'll see you in the next video.